Good morning. Good morning. I'm George Johnson. I'm your facilitator for today. Happy New Year. You see that smile on the screen? Yeah. Let's, let's replicate it on our own faces. That's the best treatment you can have for prostate cancer, is a smile. Uh, today's a special day. Not only do we start a new year, a new program, but it's my fifth anniversary. I came in here five years ago, after this program has been underway 10 years, and I came in here and this thing has become my Saturday, Saturday morning live. Uh, I came in here angry, worried, mad, frustrated. I just seen my new urologist. I had prostate cancer for 12 years. I was cured. I had radiation and my PSA was low. My doctor kept saying it was low, but it was low rising. He didn't know the difference. And I skipped two years. And then I had a PSA, it was 14. 14 after radiation is not a good number. You might add 10 to it, multiply by 10 to give you a measure of what it means. So I went to this urologist, my ex-urologist, as, as Lyle would say to you, George, he told, said, George bend over and gave me a three-month Lupron shot. He shouldn't have done that. Never start off Lupron with a 30 months, or 30, uh, a three months, excuse me, three months shot, because if it bothers you the first week, guess what? And that's what happened. But I, bef after the shot, I said, should I join a support group? Some of you have heard this before. And he said, no. <laughs> no? I said, why not? Well, they're a bunch of whiners. <laughs> uh, I know a few of you have a little sherry and Chablis now and then, but uh, <laughs> uh, I came in here one, three days after that, <coughs> sat right there, and I learned more in 10 minutes than I knew in 10 years. And I saw this gentleman, and Lyle, who can't make it today, and uh, these wonderful people, and it changed my life, changed my attitude, made me see so there is something down the road for me. And uh, so this has been an opportunity. Gene uh, and Lyle helped me get on the right path and asked me to, to help out, and, uh, and I'm here, look at me now. Huh? I'm 82, and you couldn't find a happier guy. And it's because of Saturday Morning Live. But by the way, Saturday Night Live, most of you probably don't even watch it anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's celebrated its 40th year. And this program has got, been going for 15 years. And uh, first we want to thank the uh, Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute for this facility. And if you need some additional facilities, they're out the back door here and, and down, the, uh, down the road a piece. And uh, now let me show you the cast of characters for Saturday Morning Live. <coughs> here they are. These are the same people that were here five years ago. And they're still working and they're still enjoying it. And uh, Lyle can't make it today, but Gene, uh, uh, we could have been the Blues Brothers back in uh, those days, couldn't we? <coughs> yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and then there's uh, Bill Manning, and Bill's back there. He's in the shadow because he's got the red light machine up there. And, and then there's John. Where are you, John, with your bracelets here? Uh, you want to give a little pitch for him right now or later? Uh, we'll get it later. Okay. And then uh, we have Bob Keck, who's our senior citizen, who's got, well, we'll find out when we do the little survey how many years he's got. And uh, he's got some new, uh, new experience that uh, we might share in a moment. Uh, and then our, our guy with the smile, Jim, over there. And uh, so everyone's a volunteer here. If you want to join us and get the uh, additional smiles, uh, talk to Gene about what we might use uh, help, get help for you, or you can help us. Okay, we have a newcomer package that uh, Jim passed out. Uh, all newcomers got a package. Okay, there's a yellow front page, and we like that back. If you fill it in and bring it up here, give it to Gene. And uh, Gene would like to give you a phone call and uh, welcome you and ask her any questions you have. And 
maybe be, offer you some help uh, on your specific situation. Uh, in that packet is some good uh, basic information, and I think you'd find that helpful to you. Now, what's the purpose of this group? This purpose is to help you become your own case manager. You have to manage your own case. Your doctor's got 2,000, 3,000, and it's all in his laptop, and uh, I you know some of these guys, when you go in there, they're looking at their laptop asking you how you feel, and they're not looking at you, they're looking at the laptop. So you, you don't need a laptop, but you need to keep notes. Keep a three-ring notebook, uh, and keep all your lab reports in there and lay out your own schedule when you should be doing your PSA because he may forget, like I did. And so uh, uh, you got to manage that case and that's the purpose and we'll help you do that. And it's a good place to get some networking and some uh, uh, caring support <coughs> and a lot of smiles. But we're not a substitute for your doctor. You've probably got really good doctors. What we might be able to do is stimulate some questions you might want to ask them. And uh, uh, if you have questions, prepare them in advance before you go see him. What I like to do is I like to get my PSA results before I go see him, because then I'm prepared for my questions. And uh, he needs a little training. Okay, for us to be able to support you, we need your support. We're a, a 501c3 tax exempt. And, uh, so we got small baskets, and uh, let's pass the baskets around. And uh, small baskets, so we, we need big bills to fill those small baskets. Uh, we love bills with zeros on them. It makes it easier for our, our financial guy to add them up. Uh, we're not affiliated with any religious or uh, uh, organization uh, or medical organization. Uh, so it's all open to anybody. Uh, could we get that basket? Where is that basket over here? It's there. Okay, uh, if you wouldn't mind going down the aisle with that, and uh, every $10 counts. Okay, uh, here's what we do with the money. We have uh, a website, you ought to be tuned into that. It changes uh, every, ch every week or so. We have a wonderful speaker, Dr. Snuffy Myers, who is an expert on prostate cancer, and he gives you a, a weekly report on what's new and new techniques and, uh, and encouragement. We have down here a, a library that's uh, under the care of Bob Keck, and uh, we have all kinds of good uh, literature. Some of it's free, and some of it you can rent, and some of it you can buy at a discount. Uh, we have a newsletter that, uh, that Gene puts together, and we have outreach. We're looking for new members. In that regard, let me ask you about uh, one of our outreaches, our advertising. Uh, how many saw the advertising uh, this, this, uh, this week for our program? Raise your hand if you saw it. I should ask you, how many read the uh, Union Tribune? How many get that? Well, hey, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, John Wanamaker, there's an old guy who created department stores, used to say, I know I waste half my advertising, but I don't know what half. <laughs> and that's our situation. Uh, good to see that you're seeing it. And uh, that's our keystone for, for circulating. It's a reminder to you to come to the meeting. And uh, it, we had three placements. I don't know if you remember when you read yours, but we put it in Monday in the sports section for you guys, and then uh, Tuesday in the uh, food and health section for the, your spouses that, uh, to kind of remind your, your spouse to come to this thing, and then uh, in the general section on Wednesday. So we're, we're seeing how that works. But the other part of our outreach is our brochure. We have business cards we'd like you to pick up and pass amongst your friends. Uh, the key thing here is your friends need to get their PSA tested. And my new wonderful urologist has told me when I asked him a question, has the, uh, this crazy task force that discourages uh, PSA tests, has that had an impact? He said, absolutely. We're now seeing patients come in with higher levels of PSA. We're having biopsies performed with higher levels of Gleason, Gleason 7s and 8s. 
when we used to see them at sixes. So this lag in early detection, that's the whole purpose of PSA is early detection, is having an immediate impact just within the short time of that dumb task force study. So we encourage your friends or your sons to get a PSA. And we have monthly meetings Say, hey, we're going to have a, our get-together. We haven't had one for a while. We're going to have a panel of experts, you people. Uh, three or four of you will select to, to give your story. Uh, we'll let you know ahead of time. Uh, and to share with uh, the other members your experiences, lessons learned, things you might have done differently, and, and your next steps, which you're going to be doing. And then following that, we're going to have a breakout section uh, of networking opportunities to talk, uh, talk together in individual treatment groups. So make sure you come here uh, next month because uh, this is where you get a chance to meet each other. All right, we're going to do our, our monthly survey, get uh, your elbow uh, grease ready. We're going to be raising hands here. How many are here for the first time? Raise your hand, please. Keep those hands up. Your neighbors, take a look at them. Welcome them. They're here for a reason. They probably have the same feelings I did when I came in here five years ago. Like, I don't know about this group. I don't know if I should be coming here. Just raise your hand. Give a yellow sheet. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how many have been recently diagnosed? So this is a new venture for you. Okay. Uh, You'll be informed, I'm sure. Uh, how many have had uh, prostate cancer for up to one year? There's uh, quite a few of you. Uh, you'll be learning a lot here. How many have had prostate cancer up to four years? Look at that. Good for you. How many five to 10? Uh, there's another good group. How many 11 f to 15? There you go. How many have more than 15 years? I now have 17. Okay, who's got the biggest number of the most years? Bob? 22. Oh. Anybody beat that? Now, there's a lively guy. Uh, he, he's on a new thing and we need to have, uh, you've heard of it, metformin, that's for diabetics. They did a study and found out diabetic men have uh, less prostate cancer. And they traced it back to metformin. And Bob is on that now, and uh, he goes on intermittent and it'll st uh, when he stops taking his castadex and it starts to rise. Now he's on metformin and it's, it's hung up at 3.4. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts and keep us informed. Uh, I just started taking it. Uh, some prostate cancer doctors take it. Mark Schultz takes it. So there is a, they don't know why for sure, but it does work. Um, it works for you too, doesn't it? I'm here. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> He's a long-term dues member paying person. Okay, now let's talk about treatment. Okay, now what we're gonna do, we're gonna run down these things. First, for those who have not had any invasive treatment and are on active surveillance. Let's see your hands, raise your hand. Okay, look at how many people those are. A year or two ago, there wouldn't be that many. It used to be called watchful waiting. That meant you did nothing. Uh, it's active surveillance. You're under the supervision of a doctor and you get a regular scheduled PSA and you're on your diet and exercise program. And they find out now, it's the good news, a lot of urologists are recommending starting on that before they start grabbing for the scalpel. Okay, how many have had the scalpel treatment, surgery on your prostate of some kind? That looks almost like a quarter or maybe more of you. Okay. Uh, how many have had radiation of all kinds? There's another equal group. I raise my hand. Uh, you'll notice that Gene keeps his hand up and so does John here. They, they've done them all. And because uh, it does come back. How many are ADT right now? That's me. Okay. ADT encompasses a whole host of different things. Uh, how many are in chemotherapy? Chuck, where are you? There you go. And yeah, Chuck. I'm not on it now. Oh, not on it? Oh, I got to rephrase it. Have been on it. Okay. 
That's right. Have been on it and not on it now. That's the good news. Uh, how many are under new treatments like Provenge and Cryo? Cryo. Provenge? Okay, we have Provenge here. Provenge, soon to be Zofiga and Xtandi. Yeah, try that out. Zofiga, Xtandi. How many on Xtandi? There we go. Good to see you, Tom. And uh, Tom had his PSA uh, a couple of months ago. It was 2,000. And what is it now, Tom? 139 on Xtandi. <laughs> and you're going to get another test when? At the end of the month. Okay, we're going to, it's going to continue to go down, I'm sure. Okay, how many have had recurrence? How many times? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that's one of the elements of this, uh, of this program and of the disease. You live long enough and survive, it may come back. And, uh, but now well, there's new technology and new, uh, new techniques for dealing with recurrence. How many of you here are undecided what to do? What's the next step? Okay. Uh, some have been undecided for three years and still around. Uh, hang in there. Uh, there's new technology coming all the time, and we're going to hear about that shortly. Okay, here's today's agenda, and I'll uh, give you my boss, the guy that really makes this thing work, and that's Gene. Thank you, Gene. All right. Thank you, George. Thanks for your usual fine job. Uh, I do have a question about your math, though. Knowing you're an engineer and I'm an accountant, if the group was formed in 1990, how many years is that? You're right. Whoa. Of course I'm right. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, uh, a warning for those that will return to our next meeting. Uh, uh, been advised by our liaison at uh, Sanford Burnham that uh, the bridge on Genesis as you come off I-5 is going to be under construction starting in February. So just be alert and I'll, whatever information I can find out, I'll make sure John posts in the website because uh, getting in here without coming through Genesee can be fun. Um, so I want to remind you about a, a few things. Uh, uh, Dr. J's book, The Prostate Cancer Breakthroughs 2014. I thought Dr. J would be here today. Um, I didn't see him. I was he, hoping. He, yeah, he was. Uh, he's already been over to visit these people. So, um, uh, we do have copies of his book for sale, and in in tune with that book, he mentions our group and me, and puts our phone number in there. And as a result of that, I'm now getting nationwide calls. Um, and there's nothing different about the guy in Biloxi, Mississippi, than the guy here, and she's experiencing that too. Uh, and what, what strikes me most, and just to repeat what George is talking about, is how many of these people have not been testing and suddenly they found out they've got a very serious case. I, can, I continue to repeat the uh, lady in Orange County that called me and her husband had some back pain and she finally convinced him to go to the doctor and he was heavily metastasized and a PSA of 4,000. So. And I'm hearing, as George mentioned, more and more, uh, the urologist, Dr. Lamb, confirmed it, that the people they're seeing now have more advanced cases. The unfortunate part of our disease is usually, somebody can't find their way here, uh, usually uh, you don't feel it. When you start to feel it, you're probably in pretty serious condition. So. Uh, remind everybody you know. And George mentioned to your sons, I'm having a hard time with my 45-year-old son. Uh, and so uh, do what you can. That's the best thing we can do as a group. Um, there's DVDs now of the, uh, Dr. Lamb's presentation in November. We had a lot of calls about that, so we've got quite a few of those available for you now. Um, our good friend Rick at the uh, Packed in Grand Rapids, Michigan, puts out this uh, quarterly newsletter. Some good articles in it. This just came out, so there's new ones over there. Uh, 
As always, I'd like to promote, George mentioned it, the, the invasion of the prostate snatchers by Dr. Schultz and Dr. Ralph Blum. It's a wonderful primer, especially for recently diagnosed people, whether you're recurring or uh, trying to find out what to do about your cancer. It's a real good primer. Uh, and it's just tongue in cheek. Uh, he's not saying don't do prostate surgery. He's saying there's an awful lot of alternatives and things you should do before you do surgery if that's your choice. Uh, also over there, there's four copies of the DVDs of the PCRI conference. They uh, are only for rent, but uh, available to you now. Uh, so with that, I'll lead into the speaker. I'm sure you're ready now. Uh, Bernadette Greenwood first visited us. I looked it up in June of 2011. I didn't realize it was that long ago. So uh, at that time, she was representing, representing in, in vivo corporation about a prostate imaging MRI device called the Dynatrim. Maybe some of you remember seeing that. I do. Uh, she's a reg registered technologist in radiography on MRI. And she's now with the Desert Medical Imaging as the Director of Clinical Services with offices in Indian Wells, Palm Springs, and Indio. She's associated with Dr. John Feller, who unfortunately had an issue that he couldn't overcome and couldn't be with us today. Uh, and theirs was the first site in the world to conduct transrectally delivered MRI-guided laser focal therapy in an outpatient setting. So with that, take it away, Bernadette. Welcome back. Sir. Thank you. Want me to find you? I got it. Thanks. That was a very kind introduction, and I'm privileged to be back. Um, when I was here last time, some of you may remember me. Um, I had to be really careful what I said because anytime you work for a company, they always kind of oversee what you say. Now I work for Dr. Feller, and he, he knows what I'm going to say, and he's okay with it. Um, there we go. And um, also, kind of a comparison about um, when I was here last time, I had some devices with me that, were, that had just been commercialized for the performance of MR-guided biopsy. You know, here we were a company talking about doing an intervention that was brand new when people didn't even understand the precursor which was MR imaging, right? So I think we've come a long way in terms of acceptance. Raise your hand if you've had an MRI. <laughs> Yay! When I asked that question four years ago, like only a couple had had an MRI. And for those of you who have, I think you understand now that there is a combination of diagnostic approaches that are gonna better serve you than one or two things alone and imaging has a really important role. So part of what I'm gonna talk about today is how we got where we are in 2015. And, um, John, by your courtesy. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm discombobulated. Traffic had me all thrown off this morning, and I flew in from Portland at like 11 last night. So I'm gonna show you something, and you can't really read this because it's yellow. Can we dim the lights and make it dark and creepy in here? So, because I have a lot of images yeah, that I'm gonna show. Oh, that's okay, no problem. Well, hopefully you can see. If everybody looks down here, look at how many prostate MRIs are done. Of all the imaging done in the United States, that's how many prostate MRIs are done. Can you believe that? But the good news, if you could see it down here, hang on. Growth of 150%, that's fantastic. They're coming around. So it's kind of like women in board seats, you know? We don't hold many CEO positions, but we're getting more board seats. So um, it's okay. I like to see that there is growth because this is going to be very helpful down the road, not only for initial diagnosis, but for staging, for therapy delivery, and also for monitoring and follow-up. So how did we get here? Um, I like to play the talking head song, you know, where is that beautiful car and where is my beautiful wife? How we got here was just very simply the low sensitivity and specificity of PSA and digital rectal exam. And even when combined, they're fairly um, non-sensitive and non-specific. We're going to take a walk through time. I know we, we shared some time with George and Jean and the rest of the gentlemen who've been survivors for a decade, two decades or more. Let's talk about what started in the 20s, 
where we are right now and what the future looks like. So back in the 20s, the way they did biopsy was they'd do an incision and poke around and take a specimen, and then they'd sew you back up. Then they started doing this thing where they would put a stainless steel sound down the urethra, use the finger as a guide, do a, a palpated biopsy, and then we had some bad things go on that detracted from medical progress. And then in the 60s, Watanabe-san um, obtained the first clinically useful ultrasound images of the <laughs> prostate. And back in the 60s, that was kind of a landmark. Um, at that same time, McNeil uh, published zonal anatomy. So what I mean by zonal anatomy, and for those of you who understand it, you get it. But for those of you who don't, we have known anatomic landmarks and a margin around the gland that can be used to define zones. So when your pathologist looks at a specimen under the microscope, when a surgeon looks at a gland surgically, and when a radiologist looks at imaging slices, they're all talking about the same place in space. And then the 70s, we got lazy. And then in the 80s, transducers came about. So um, Jean had mentioned, you know, um, I had worked for this company, and it was a great company to work for because I was in product development, research and development, and my degree is in radiologic sciences, and I'm currently pursuing, and I pray I get there before I die, is uh, a PhD in advanced imaging with a focus on quantitative oncology. So um, how do we measure cancer? How do we see cancer? And how do we quantify it and follow it? So um, a lot of the things that have been evolutionary, I'm very lucky that I've been around since the 80s because I witnessed this. I was able to see the introduction of um, transvaginal and transrectal transducers so we could image the pelvic structures much better. And then also, um, the PSA test was approved by the FDA in the 80s, and we came up with the sextant scheme for prostate biopsy under ultrasound guidance also back in the 80s. And a sextant biopsy is simply one, two, three, four, five, six samples. That's what they did years ago, for those of you who know and those of you who don't know. Then it was decided that because of the low detection yield and um, kind of over-treatment, kind of to hedge bets, um, they wanted to extend that scheme. It was thought that if we do more cores and we direct them laterally, we'll detect more cancer. Well, the problem was, what if it's here, what if it's here, and what if it's here? And um, a solution to that in the early 2000s was take an MR image, determine where that thing is, use an MR-compatible device that's imageable safely in MR, to use an MR-safe gun to gain access to the prostate and have a computer program to show us how to get there. And then um, it's right now um, a number of companies are um, investigating the use of historic MR data fused with real-time ultrasound to improve results. So also in the 2010s, something really important that happened was the NZCN guidelines for the first time talked about multiparametric MRI. That's a big deal. And for those of you who don't know what multiparametric MRI is, I make a lot of baking analogies because I love to bake. So when you make a cake, you've got flour, sugar, water, milk, whatever. When you make an MRI, you have repetition time, echo time, flip angle, bandwidth. You have all these parameters that you mix together that give you the black, the white, and the gray that makes the picture of whatever it is you're imaging. Um, so if I only use one group of parameters and take a single image, that's kind of like taking a picture in a vacuum. If I alter those parameters and exploit things that'll make infection, malignancy, and inflammation bright or dark or suck up gadolinium contrast fast, and if I can also watch anatomy, morphology, and function, those things all combined is multi-parametric MRI. So just taking a single picture and saying you got a prostate MRI, that's fine, and I'll show you an example of why it might not be fine. Um, but doing functional imaging in addition to anatomic imaging is what's multi-parametric MRI. And they say it's T2 weighting plus functional sequences like diffusion. Diffusion's just one of a, a bunch of different kinds. And then beyond the 2000s, some um, work that's been done in Europe is MR guidance for transperineal cryotherapy, MR guidance for transperineal laser therapy, and MR guidance for transrectally delivered MR um, guided laser therapy, which is what I'll talk about today. 
Um, and I'm not going to bore you with epidemiology. You're all painfully aware of what it is. But what frustrates me is when we look at the incidence and mortality for breast and prostate cancer, 235,000 cases of breast cancer, 233 cases of prostate cancer, 40,000 breast cancer deaths, 30,000 prostate cancer deaths. Hold on to your hats for a second. Look at funding. $625 million for breast cancer, $288 million down from $300 million for prostate. And I, I don't mean to be funny about this, but when I do advocacy meetings, and it might have even been this very meeting where I said, you know, we women, we get together, we talk about our breasts, we talk about our vaginas. You guys, you get together, what do you talk about? And this guy raised his hand, he goes, we talk about your breasts and your vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, not the answer I was looking for, albeit the truth. <laughs> But let's, this group is so powerful because in sharing your experiences, good and bad, you're all educating each other. And the good news for me today, it's the first time I've spoken before this group without someone breathing, I'm not gonna use that phrase, without someone guiding what I say, you know? And, and I, I've worked for outstanding companies that have made phenomenal products, um, but it's nice to be able to talk as director of a clinical trial and a person with a clinical background who's here to help patients, not a company. So um, back in 2009, the guidelines for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network were repeat bad test after repeat bad test after repeat bad test. And the only time it's bad is when it's done in a vacuum and done alone. We've got to combine these tests to get um, reasonable results and not just do the same thing over and over hoping for a different result. Um, and again, I mentioned now it says insert imaging at the appropriate point of the diagnostic workup. And now this year, the NCCN, or last year, the NCCN guidelines address specifically PSA. So for those of you who are going to U.S. Preventative Services Task Force guidelines and seeing verbiage that talks about discouraging screening or not encouraging screening, <laughs> there are guidelines that do encourage it. And, and if you want it, you should have it, and it should be an informed um, well-educated decision made with your care provider. Um, so last time I was here, we did talk about the number of biopsies that are done, and sometimes the path of the gentleman goes from random transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy to saturation biopsy. And um, the problem with those mechanisms is if you miss the lesion, the man could be harboring clinically significant disease. If you pick up something low grade and there's something far anterior or elsewhere um, that's clinically significant or aggressive, he'll be sent down the wrong path, potentially active surveillance when in fact he needs more. And then um, the other problem is skimming something aggressive where it's got um, a component of high grade cancer in it, and we see this. So typically in a transrectal ultrasound delivered biopsy, you'll see the needles are inserted to a depth of about two centimeters. In a large gland and with an anterior lesion, you're gonna miss that. So everybody in this room probably knows how Gleason score is determined, but we'll go over it for those that don't or maybe don't have a firm grasp of it. Um, this is usually where I open a bag of Skittles and I explain that um, you know it's like Skittle sorting. Uh, when, when the pathologist gets the specimen, what they're looking at is cell architecture and arrangement. If the cells are tightly packed and organized and neat, they're at the low end of the suspicion or aggressiveness scale. And if they're very disorganized and um, uh, architecturally uh, uh, dis disfigured and diverse, that's more aggressive disease. And then you've got middle of the road and either side, right? So if one man comes in and has a biopsy and the pathologist looks under the microscope, they look at what's the most dominant cell type, and let's say it's three. The primary Gleason grade is three. Then they look again and see what's the most, the second most prevalent cell type, and let's say that's four. Three plus four equal two. Seven. Seven. And then, so the next guy comes in, pathologist looks at that specimen, the most dominant cell type is four, and the second most dominant cell type is three. That's a four plus three, also equal to seven, but who has the worst disease? The second guy, because the screaming architecture is the worst kind. So that's how it's figured out. 
Um, and then, again, we get back to MR imaging and doing the biopsy with targeting. If we're going to target a biopsy and grade based on what we get from a core, don't we want that core to come from someplace meaningful, not out in space? So, I mean, people called me wacky 10 years ago when I first started talking about this, and I'm so, so grateful that years have gone by and there's evidence-based literature that does support the role of MRI. And I'm going to show you something that I found yesterday morning that um, you all can take to your physicians who may not feel strongly about MR, either for detection or for monitoring in an active surveillance environment. So um, what a saturation biopsy looks like, for those of you who've not undergone it, if um, your clinician's suggesting that you have it, it's essentially a grid with um, uh, ABC123, and they um, take out systematically um, cores in a template scheme. And um, I may not have told this story last time I was here because I don't think it happened, um, but I got this in invitation to like the third international workshop on minimally invasive ablative therapy of kidney and prostate cancer in Washington, D.C. And the chair of the meeting was Dr. Tom Palasik from Duke University. He's a professor of surgery, urologist. And I look at the brochure and I'm like, oh my God, that guy tried to kill me when I was 12. So I Googled him, and it was him, and so I emailed him, and I'm like, hey, Tom, it's been 34 years since you grabbed me by the ankle in the deep end of the Hillcrest Junior High School swimming pool and tried to drown me during gym class, but it's a good thing I don't hold a grudge. I'll see you in D.C. And he's the nicest guy. Um, when we were in school, you know, we sat together in algebra, and, you know, he tried to drown me in the pool, but all that being said, um, Tom Palasic is a leader in focal therapy. Um, the, the philosophy of minimally invasive procedures and the, the whole premise that if we can do something non-invasively and keep an eye on you before doing something aggressive in the right setting, clearly we don't want to jump into focal therapy or minimally invasive therapy for somebody who clearly needs surgery and radiation, right? So anyway, um, Tom was nice and gave me some slides to show what saturation biopsy looks like, and you've got the gloved hands of the urologist there. You've got the um, transducer in the patient's rectum, and you have the needle guide going through the template and into the prostate, and that's the inferior wall of the urinary bladder, and that's P. And so the gentleman is in the lithotomy position with the plate up against him, and we do the ABC123, and usually they're under general anesthesia or a pedendal block or some other sort of pain management, and this is what we end up with. But now that MRI is available, it used to be very sensible to go in. If, if you know, six cores doesn't get it, well, let's do 18. If 18 doesn't get it, well, let's do 100. And those days, I think, are close to being over because we now have a mechanism not only to see anatomy, but also to see function and just do a better job at getting after the thing that's sending the PSA through the roof. And also, I think when we talk about pathology costs, when you consider each of these cups is anywhere between 150 and 250 bucks a pop to stick under a microscope, you know, you've got these insurance companies and the government kind of bearing down on everybody about the cost, the cost, the cost. Well, I think, you know, it's reasonable to assume that if we do less cores and it's minimally invasive and we avoid pain, bleeding, and infection and also reduce the cost of pathology, it might be a good thing. Um, so how has MRI evolved? When we look at the magnets that we used to use back in the 80s, um, they weren't as good as the ones today, period. The cars that we used to drive in the 80s aren't as good, and I didn't even own a cell phone back in the 80s. So a lot's happened in you know, 30 years. Um, improved pulse sequences. I talked about multi-parametric MRI. We have pulse sequences. That's the scan, the individual scans that make up your MR exam that give the radiologist the information to make recommendations regarding your, your treatment um, and your therapy. And then this multi-parametric approach improves sensitivity. So um, we personally use um, high channel count surface coils. We don't use an interrectal coil. I published a couple cases on radiology and uh, Eurorad and a couple other places. Patients with no rectum, they exist. So to say that you have to use an interrectal coil you can't in some men, and some men just don't want it. So what a lot of people don't understand about MRI physics is that the elements in a coil, um, their size determines their depth of penetration. So a small coil has a, sh a shallow depth of penetration, and a bigger coil has a deeper depth of penetration. 
What we use at our institution is two eight-channel coils, one on the front, one on the back, and they're in a dual array, and we can see what we need to see. So um, this was the thing that I saw yesterday. I got an email about this, and this is really important, that MRI, when um, used appropriately with a multi-parametric approach, um, if it doesn't detect quote unquote invisible lesions, everybody says, oh, but MRI doesn't pick up everything. We don't want to pick up everything. We don't want to pick up Gleason 1. We don't want to pick up Gleason 2. We want to pick up Gleason 6 and higher. We especially want to pick up Gleason 7 that needs treatment and higher. So this is a really important paper and you can find it at this website. Um, for those of you who want the presentation, I'll give it as a PDF to Jean and there's all references in here that you're welcome to look at yourself. Um, and this is just another illustration of what we do at our institution. Here's a nice anatomic image that shows the zonal anatomy of the gland with the lesion right there. And we can see on the fusion weighted sequences and the color maps, it's like screaming, my, my 13 year old son, he's been doing breast quantification and prostate quantification with me since he was like five because I didn't own a TV for a long time. And I would bring my engineering computer home and process cases. He'd go, ooh, mommy, there's the cancer. Yes, son, there it is. Um, so the important thing about diffusion is it's really a workhorse sequence that um, can help us also um, potentially distinguish infection from cancer. It, only a biopsy can tell you if you have cancer. Only a biopsy can tell you if you have PIN. Only a biopsy can tell you if you have prostatitis. MR and the quantitative tools associated with MR can throw flags that say, holy cow, this looks like it could be infection. If the ADC is a certain value, it's not so worrisome as if it's a very low value. And the literature has shown that there's an inverse linear correlation between ADC value and aggressiveness of disease. So if a guy has really aggressive cancer, the ADC value on his diffusion sequence is going to be pretty low. That's kind of the understanding. And so once we have that MRI, what do we do? We, we do an MR-guided biopsy. If, if it looks like a skunk and it smells like a skunk, it's probably a skunk. So we use the same modality that we saw it with to go take a piece of it. So using software and the hardware um, Dynatrim, we're able to get in there and take a, a sample. And how does this shake out in terms of undergrading? Well, it's a known fact that random biopsy undergrades 46% of the time. MR only undergrades 5% of the time. And I actually had a doctor call me once asking, oh, it undergrades 5% of the time. That's terrible. I'm like, well, nothing's 100% that I know of. If you know of it, let me know. But this is as good as it gets. As far as, as far as we know. And then that same group who, who um, demonstrated those numbers did a, a nice study where they compared second repeat trust biopsy, which is the blue bar, to third repeat trust biopsy and compared to MR guided biopsy. And in patients with PSAs up to 20, MR guided biopsy picked up the cancer 59% of the time, where second and third trust only picked it up 15 and 8% respectively. So again, the question comes up, well, oh gosh, only 59%. I said cancer yield. I didn't say pin, I didn't say prostatitis, and I didn't say tuberculosis and everything. We see everything but ovaries in these prostate biopsies. But to say that a cancer yield is 59%, that's just cancer. But most of the time we're answering the diagnostic question, why is the PSA so high? Well, he's got pin or he's got this or he's got that. So um, let's take a quick look at who benefits from MR imaging. Gentlemen with an elevated PSA and negative transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, year over year over year, take a picture. Rising PSA after prostatectomy or post-radiation. Many of you know this, but for those of you who don't, PSA is gland specific, not prostate specific, meaning, excuse me, not cancer specific. PSA is gland specific, not cancer specific, meaning if you have a prostate, if you own one, you're making PSA right now in some quantity. If you don't own a prostate, you shouldn't be making PSA. My PSA is zero. Anyone who's had prostatectomy, theoretically, your PSA should go to zero because you don't have a prostate anymore. People whose PSA start going up, that's when they worry about biochemical recurrence. 
Now men who've had other treatment besides surgery, you still have a prostate. So you will still make PSA, but after your treatment, it bottoms out at a level that they refer to as the nadir, and like November, A-D-I-R, nadir. That's the low level it hangs out at post-treatment, and if it creeps up to full two points above your nadir, that's when they call it biochemical recurrence or PSA failure and get you back in for more testing, imaging, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay. So guys with a positive digital rectal exam with negative trust, if you put a finger in there and you feel around and there's something asymmetric or um, uh, nodular or uh, suspicious and you put a needle there and it comes back negative, it might also be a good time to take a picture. Um, Preoperative and pretreatment planning, certainly for staging, nerve sparing procedures, guidance for radiation, and volume determination. And when I say volume determination, I don't just mean the gland volume, but also the tumor volume. Because there's a lot of guys walking around with Gleason 6, and we talk about sparse pattern Gleason 6 disease and high volume Gleason 6. One is probably more amenable to active surveillance, the other Folks talk more about treatment. So um, MR is also an objective means to monitor active surveillance for you men who are being watched year over year over year with lab tests. Stick a picture in there and see if anything's changing. Um, and selection for focal therapy. Every single one of the men in our program has had not only a multiparametric MRI, but an MR-guided biopsy. We will not deliver therapy to anybody who comes to us with just a trust biopsy for the reasons we talked about before. Here's a case study that shows a gentleman who had two negative trust biopsies. Meantime, uh, aggressive cancer was within reach. Um, here's another patient who benefited from a wide resection, um, sparing the left side and removing the right. The neurovascular bundles are these little black dots that live on either side of the prostate, and they kind of cradle it like skinny fingers, and those are the nerves that control erectile function. And we don't want to get rid of those if we don't have to. Post-radiation. This man had iodine-125 seed placement, and I keep this case. It's an old one but it speaks to a few things. You know, he was lost to follow-up. He didn't go to the doctor for eight years and then shows up at the doctor with a PSA of about three. At imaging, and I like this case a lot too because it shows um, not only a decreased T2 signal, um, abnormal diffusion, and hyperfusion, all glaring indications of recurrence, um, we also had spectroscopy on this guy, and we'll talk a little bit about spectroscopy. We don't do it in our practice for a number of reasons. Generally, it requires an endorectal coil, which we don't use, and also it takes about anywhere between 9 and 14 minutes, and also it's only reimbursed in the brain today. So I know a lot of guys call the prostate the little brain, but CMS doesn't. <laughs> Neither does Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So, and this man had a recurrence of Gleason 7 disease. I always like it when my subjects are able to get us whole mount pathology because it's really important for us. I hope, hope, hope 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I'm able to look back retrospectively, not only at the imaging findings on our subjects, but their PSAs, their genomics, um, and also their whole mount path on the ones that have gone on to surgery. A lot of this is going to benefit men who really want minimally invasive treatment instead of surgery. And we want to do it responsibly and sensibly, which is why we have to conduct clinical trials to evaluate the efficacy. So this is another one that was heartbreaking. This gentleman had five truss biopsies. Meantime, he's got this five centimeter lesion growing like an orange rind over um, the anterior part of his gland. And so to do the biopsy, it's not that big a deal. Has anybody had an MR-guided biopsy using this needle guide in the bore of the MR? Anybody in the room had an MR-guided biopsy? One. Hi there. How are you doing, Dr. Cohen? Fine. How are you, buddy? Really good. Good to see you, sir. So um, this little thing is the size of my finger, and that's actually my finger. I'm a little person, and it doesn't hurt. Does it? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I just don't want to speak out of turn, 
But so what it looks like for the patient is they lay prone on the MR table with coils on the back and coils on the front. The needle guide is inserted in the rectum using viscous lidocaine or some other topical anesthetic. The biopsy guns are titanium. These aren't your urologist's biopsy guns, which are typically stainless steel. They're used and they're thrown away. These are used and thrown away, but because they're made of titanium, which is a precious metal, it's put into the MR scanner and imaged in the spot where the specimen was taken. That image gets sent to the pathologist, so the pathologist knows exactly where the core came from. So some of the insurance companies have just not come around and reimbursed for these, so patients bear the cost of the guns, which I think in years to come, um, hopefully insurances will cover it. But anyway, so um, the cores are usually dependent on the size of the lesion and the geography of the lesion. If it's a big thing shaped like a snowman that courses across the gland, we might take three or four. If it's a single small lesion, we'll only take two. And again, we talk about that cancer detection rate. And this is a targeted method. Um, the path that we took was very similar to what we did in breast MRI. Breast MR um, evolved as a complement to mammography and ultrasound. Um, it's an intervention that's targeted. And um, quite frankly, I don't know any woman in the room who would be agreeable to their physician saying, I'm going to insert 18 needles into the quadrant of your breast that I think you have cancer in, and we'll tell you what we think. You know, um, and then if we come back negative, we'll just repeat it next year and a blood test. So imaging isn't crazy. I think it's extremely sensible. I think it's rational, and I think it's logical, and there's evidence-based medicine to support it. So again, you know, complement the gold standard of PSA digital rectal exam and trust biopsy. Um, target the biopsy under MR guidance if possible and, and feasible, fuse it to another modality. And also perform focal therapy instead of whole gland treatment. And again, if it looks like a skunk and smells like a skunk, it's probably a skunk. Now we're going to get to the meat of the matter and begin talking about laser interstitial thermal therapy um, delivered transrectally. So that whole shebang that I showed you earlier that's used for the biopsy, back when I worked at the company that developed and commercialized it, in the back of my mind it always occurred to me that it made a lot of sense to get within you know, millimeter accuracy to target something for biopsy, but also for delivery of therapy, be it an energy source or toxic agent or particles or whatever. Getting access is the most important step. So um, very conveniently, the laser fits right down this needle guide. Um, it's a 980 nanometer diode for you engineers in the room. Um, it's got a heat diffusing tip, and we insert it using a 13 or 14 gauge titanium coaxial. Um, it's just a simple computer that has a laser delivery system, a cooling catheter system, and also a visualization package that lets us map the thermal um, behavior of the gland as we're treating it. So remember earlier I talked about MRI is like baking. You have a TR, a TE, a flip angle, a bandwidth, and all that fancy stuff. The TE of the acquisition contributes not only to the image generation, but it can also measure phase shifts and generate temperature maps. So while we're um, inside the patient with the laser, we contour the tumor that's being treated, place little safety zones over important structures like the rectal wall, the neurovascular bundles, or the external urethral sphincter, and treat only that area. But we get to watch it as we do it. Before we administer the treatment, we give a non-therapeutic dose at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, like you'd have with a cold. And we observe the temperature to ensure that we're in the place that we need to be. And then we crank up the wattage to do the coagulation necrosis that destroys the area um, of cancer. So to give you an example, we had our first patient um, back in May of 2010, and this gentleman had a high PSA. His trust biopsy proved he had Gleason 6 disease. We imaged him and saw a lesion that was very treatable, um, looked at it with multiple functional sequences, and then did the biopsy using the MR guidance system. And you can see the needle in the thrown position going right smack through the tumor. Nobody can argue where that specimen came from. 
And that's the photomicrograph of his Gleason 3 plus 4 equal to 7 disease. At trust, they thought he was 3 plus 3. When we imaged him and did the targeted biopsy, we got 3 plus 4. So then we did the laser, and this is just a dirty gradient echo scan. It's a fast, fast, fast scan. We've already done the diagnostic imaging. We know where this thing is. All we're doing with this image is placing the fiber into the gland. Once it's been placed in, you could see this fast forward movie where we apply the heat. We could see exactly where we're cooking, and we can watch the estimated damage grow. And once we've gotten beyond the margins of it, we stop. Each treatment is anywhere between two and two and a half minutes, and we cycle maybe four, five, six, seven times, depending on the size and geography of the lesion. And then after the treatment, we've got a big cavity here where the thing was, some inflammatory response. And um, you can see the pre, the intra, and the post-treatment images. And so the folks who were doing this uh, under the leadership of John Feller, um, when he was established as a beta site for this technology back in 2010, um, he obtained institutional review board approval to embark on a clinical trial. So it's been going on since 2010. Roger McNichols um, has passed away. He's the PhD scientist who was my partner to establish desert medical imaging initially and Emory University and a handful of others in the United States and Europe. Um, Axel Winkle is an engineer at, um, in vivo, Stuart May, physician at Desert Medical Imaging, Wes Jones, the tech at Desert Medical Imaging. We're also partnering with UCLA as part of a phase one trial evaluating MR ultrasound fusion to deliver laser therapy. So the clinical trial itself is a single institution IRB approved pilot study, which is a feasibility and safety study um, IRB Protocol 20140945, you can find it on clinicaltrials.gov. It's prospective, meaning we start looking at the guy the day we treat him and watch him going forward. We're not taking old data, historic stuff that's happened already and looking backward. It's forward looking. Non-randomized, uncontrolled, 100 patients is my goal. We've done 49 treatments so far, so I'm halfway there. And when I joined Dr. Feller's group last May, we had done like, I think, 22, 24 treatments. Now we've done 49. So I think we're on a quick path to get into 100 to be able to finally publish the long-term results and be able to watch these subjects, like I said, for 10 or 20 years. Um, this is patient-funded research. We did not get an NIH grant, so our patients uh, pay an entry fee to enter the trial. And again, the first patient was May 2010. It's done in an outpatient setting. You don't have to go to the hospital. And it's the lovely desert, um, so a lot of people like to make a weekend of it. Um, it's MR guided at 1.5 Tesla. And um, the guidelines for performance of multiparametric MRI were published last week. The ACR says 1.5T and 3T are equally acceptable for detection and localization of clinically significant prostate cancer. So if anybody tries to tell you that you have to have 3T, please understand the physics behind image generation. Theoretically, 3T has higher signal, and that's fantastic. One and a half T parameters can be optimized for small part imaging, and that's what we do. So if you took a protocol that's run at 3T and you move it directly over to one and a half T, it is true that it'll have higher signal at 3T. But if the protocol is adapted and you optimize it, to generate enough signal to image the prostate, you can do it. Every single image I've shown you today was done on one and a half T. So it, sometimes it can be um, a little tricky for patients to understand. Um, so we use a dual eight channel array, which ends up being 16 channel, channels, flexible phased array GP coils, so we can avoid the problem of losing men to follow up because they feel um, the endorectal coil is more than they can handle. Um, everything we use is FDA 510K cleared. Every single thing we touch is approved by the FDA. What's new is the approach. So um, we knew that this approach was being done elsewhere outside the United States using a transperineal approach, putting the patient in the lithotomy position and going through the skin. And so it stood to reason if we've been doing one and a half million truss biopsies transrectally, for 30 years, why not deliver this small applicator transrectally to deliver the therapy? And so the good news is there's been no deleterious effects. Um, 
We don't use general anesthesia. Patient walks in and walks out, and we don't insert a catheter unless for some reason there's a need to, but we don't do it routinely. Um, patients sign an Institutional Review Board of Informed Consent. They go off anticoagulant therapy. Anytime anybody's sticking a needle in you for any reason, let them know if you're on anticoagulants because we don't want you to bleed. Um, fleet enema to clean things out, um, five days of Cipro. Some patients get Keflex if they have a problem with Cipro. And they also get IV chlorophorin the day of the procedure. Clear liquids after midnight, nothing to eat in the morning. We have them void completely, no pee in the bladder. Um, benzocaine gel to insert the needle guide. And we do a little subcapsular injection of lidocaine to minimize pain. So we establish an IV to give conscious sedation. We love happy drugs. Um, we don't want you walking out or experiencing pain. Um, so Versed and fentanyl are used. We monitor you through the whole procedure with MR-compatible monitoring. Um, the procedure is technically called interstitial laser coagulation necrosis. We use real-time monitoring with MR thermometry in multiple planes, which I explained the MR image is the MR image, but the parameters used to generate that image can also generate a thermal map. We contour just like your um, medical dosimetrist does for radiation treatment planning, contour the area that we're going to treat and eliminate the visible abnormality and a centimeter beyond, confirm the coagulation necrosis with a contrast enhanced sequence, and any patient that requires it if they're treated um, in an area very close to the urethra, we may put in a cadet catheter. So the kit itself, um, like I described, those are the pieces of it. Um, our inclusion criteria is men at least 45 uh, with an estimated life expectancy of five years, tumor suspicious region visible on MR at one and a half T, prostate cancer on MR guided biopsy, a Gleason score of greater than, or excuse me, less than or equal to seven that's organ confined, and I can't stress the organ confined part enough. If it's in the seminal vesicles, we're not going to treat it. Um, unifocal, unilateral, or index lesions, even if they have a non-index lesion nearby with low risk characteristics, we'll treat the index lesion. Um, we have a salvage therapy limb. We've treated four men who've undergone other modalities of treatment. So um, as of September of this year, we are now taking in men who've undergone some other modality of treatment and have recurrence, and no one will do surgery or any kind of treatment on them. We'll debulk the tumor and um, help them extend um, their life expectancy. Exclusion criteria, high PSA density and multifocal bilateral large lesions. And the other thing we don't dabble in is what we call whack-a-mole. Obviously, if a patient's presenting with multiple new tumors in new locations, you don't want to attempt to focally treat a patient like that. So our outcomes me measures, the primary outcome measure is number of patients that have serious adverse events or death, and the number is zero right now. Um, secondary measure is absence of cancer in the target area on MR-guided biopsy at six-month follow-up, and the time frame that we watch from treatment is one year. What we do is a multi-parametric MRI 48 hours after treatment, three months after treatment, six months after treatment, and then one year after treatment. So when patients sign up for the program, I sit with them at their first consult and tell them it's going to be like a long date. They're going to get sick of me. And um, the, the spouses and partners uh, get to know us very well, and they usually are the providers of the PSA and all the um, surveys that we collect through the course of the treatment and the follow-up. We also do an ultrasound 48 hours after the procedure to make sure that all the urine drains out of the bladder properly. Um, MR-guided biopsy is done at the treatment site at the six-month follow-up, regardless of what we see. Um, with the software and the hardware, we're able to go right back to the treated area and biopsy it, even if there are no significant findings. And that's for the purpose of documenting no recurrence. Um, serum PSAs are collected at 3, 6, and 12 months. And the quality of life surveys that we use are the International Prostate Symptom Score and Sexual Health Inventories. And those are initially um, collected as baselines. And um, here's what things look like so far. Um, this is as of November of 2014. We had done 34 patients four of whom were salvage patients, those ones that had already been treated with another modality. 
Um, 45 cancer foci were treated. The range of age of our patients was 50 to 81. Um, the young guy called me the night after his treatment, and he's like, Bernadette, you're not going to believe it. I had sex with my wife tonight. And I'm like, good job. So, and like, I never thought. My mom, I tell her these things. She's like, really? <laughs> but it, this is good. You know, when we think about the trifecta of, of um, prostate cancer success, we want oncologic control, preservation of sexual function, and urologic function. So if we can achieve those three things, even if it's temporary, so a lot of our men have been in the program for three, four years, and a few have gone on to surgery, as you'll see in a minute, but what they enjoyed before they went to surgery was X number of years of normal, normal, you know? So um, their initial PSAs ranged from 0.9 to 28, with a mean PSA of 7.48. The tumor volumes that we treated, oh, and pay close attention to this. The range was 0.9 to 28. We had a couple guys come in um, with very, very low PSAs whose prostate cancer was detected incidentally through other diagnostic tests. So, and it all kind of, I don't you know, mean to confuse things any, but PSA is an extraordinarily important prognostic outcomes measure, and we need to do it religiously and serially. The number in and of itself in a vacuum, stand alone, isn't so helpful as when you watch it over time. Um, the tumor volumes, we did a really big one, uh, four cc's, and the mean volume was 0.8 cc's. Where were these things? In the treatment naive cohort, these are the men who'd never been treated with anything ever. They had just been diagnosed. 12 tumors were three plus three, 18 tumors were three plus four, 10 tumors were four plus three. And when, when you see that the number of patients is less than the number of cancers, that's because some patients had more than one cancer. And this patient, one of these 14 patients that had a Gleason three plus four, may also have had a three plus three or a four plus three. None of them had three. All of them had one or two. Um, the zonal anatomy breakdown, 25 of these tumors were in the peripheral zone, which we've known for years is the place where most of them occur. 14 were in the transition zone, and only one was in the central zone. Oh, I see yellow writing. Um, and then brachytherapy for our salvage arm. One man had brachytherapy, excuse me, two men had brachytherapy, and there were three lesions that we treated. One man had proton beam, and he had a recurrence of four plus five, and one had cryotherapy. And of those lesions, one was a three plus four, three were a four plus three, and one was a four plus five. This guy sent me a Christmas card, I cried, because his PSA was down to 0.5. So, and he had essentially been headed for palliative care. So, in our treatment naive group, total procedure time runs and in all groups, one and a half to four hours, depending on how many we're treating and what they look like. Aiming at the spot is very time consuming. It's very precise, very time consuming, which is why we give you know, the medication to keep people happy. The treatment itself is only two to two and a half minutes repeated five, seven times. The goal is to eliminate the um, abnormality, C not MR, and the volume of coagula coagulation necrosis we measure afterwards. Thus far, no serious adverse events and no death. We like that. We had two guys that developed asymptomatic periprostatic necrosis, um, one case of a retention cyst, and that was as of November. We have another guy that developed a retention cyst. You know how sometimes if you cut your skin, um, you'll see the scarring and the healing, but you get a little bubble of fluid next to it. This is essentially what a retention cyst is. It's like an inflammatory response to something, and you just drain them. It's no big deal. Um, seven patients with positive biopsy at the treatment site consistent with residual cancer, which gave us a positive margin rate of 23%. While that sounds scary that there was residual or recurrent cancer, there's residual or recurrent cancer with every treatment modality. Um, cryo, HIFU, RF, and surgery. And those recurrence rates range from 28% to 46% in the literature. So right now, I think we're doing okay. And I wanna, like I said, watch these guys. We're one, two, three, and four years out on every one of these gentlemen, 
and to watch them for 10 years is what's going to be impactful, not only to them as individuals and to us as researchers, but also to the government and the payers, because ultimately they're the ones they're going to decide who gets what. Um, four patients were retreated with focal therapy, and I love it. Um, sometimes in Dr. Feller's lectures, he'll say it's like a haircut. You know, if it grows back, you just do another haircut. <laughs> That's a good analogy, but we do we do have the ability to retreat, and um, the surgeons that have done surgeries post laser aren't stating that they have any technical difficulty with surgery, unlike radiation therapy or things that make the tissue of the prostate gland and its surrounding structures really fibrous. Some of those could kind of interfere with the approach surgically. So um, laser doesn't do that. And imagine, if you will, and this sounds silly, but picture a little plum um, in, a, in a nest of spaghetti. I always use food analogies. If you stick a little needle in that plum, you're not, you're not touching the spaghetti. And then when you take it out, it still sits in the spaghetti, and you could go in there with a fork or tongs or whatever and take the plum out. Now, if you have the plum in the spaghetti and you radiate the whole area and things get hard, you're going to have a tough time taking the plum out of the spaghetti. That's a silly analogy, but that's what the surgeon is faced with after a radiation uh, treatment to the gland. Um, PSA rates on these gentlemen, they all fell about 35% post-treatment. And their IPSS and SHIM scores had no, sti no statistically significant change, meaning nobody came to me after therapy saying, oh my god, now I'm incontinent. Oh my god, now I'm impotent. They had their baseline IPSS and SHIM scores, and those didn't vary statistically significantly post-treatment. We had one gentleman, um, when we look at withdrawals, who's no longer in the program, one gentleman developed metastatic melanoma unrelated to anything with his prostate cancer or his treatment. One gentleman withdrew after his six-month biopsy was negative. Um, he lived outside the United States in um, New Zealand and didn't want to come back for follow-up. Four patients went on to whole gland therapy. Two of them were four plus four. One of them was four plus three, and one of them was three plus three. Um, the, these incidence cancer patients um, Three of them elected radical prostatectomy. One of them elected um, proton beam, but he hadn't had a six-month biopsy yet, so his logic kind of puzzles me. And it's unfortunate sometimes gentlemen will make up their mind, and then they'll go do a thing without talking, and then you can't unring the bell. Um, and the thing, like I said before, there was no additional technical difficulty reported with the radical prostatectomy post-laser, and our incidence cancer rate is only 10%. So our small series conclusions, transrectal outpatient MR-guided focal laser ablation of the prostate is feasible and safe. Um, positive margin rate 23%, whole gland therapy rate 10%. Patients are still retreatable if viable, meaning if that cancer is still localized and within the gland, um, they're still retreatable. And patients who've had um, other modalities of treatment uh, can have salvage therapy. Um, there's a continuity of imaging modality that we prefer. We do the multiparametric imaging with a machine. We do the biopsy with that same machine and the same team. We do the laser therapy imaging and thermometry with that same machine and the same team. And we do the follow-up with that same machine and the same team. So our reduction of variability in the diagnosis, treatment, delivery, and follow-up is just reduced by virtue of the path we took. So I'd like to acknowledge Dr. May, Dr. Feller, Wes, John Stratmeyer, Axel Winkle, and posthumously Roger McNichol. And if you have questions that you're not wanting to ask in a public forum, my email is right there. And Dr. Feller may be able to join us by FaceTime, so I'm going to get him on the horn if I can. He's working today in Indian Wells, but um, he may be able to break away. Um, he also has YouTube videos that um, were made probably three years ago, so some of the numbers may be different than what I presented today. Don't be alarmed because it's old, but if you go to www.desertmedicalimaging.com and you go down to the bottom, there's YouTube videos. There's a series of like four or five of them that go over like 15-minute blocks 
of what I just covered. Um, again, it's from maybe 2012, 2011, and this is the most recent update. And I hope I've kind of shed some light on what all is happening in the world of focal therapy. Those of you who are considering it, you're not crazy. Um, those of you who um, just have questions, I'm at your disposal. And George, he's going to moderate the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, very informative. Uh, appreciate the historical background. A little clarification. When you talked about doing all those saturation things, you don't do that, do you? No. You no. don't do that. No. OK. And when you say MRI guided biopsy, it's the phrase we have heard more common here, targeted biopsy. Correct. Now, yeah. um, it, they're not uh, one and the same. <coughs> MR guidance is MR in the bore of the MR scanner. And it's a form of MR targeted biopsy. There's another kind of MR targeted biopsy that's cognitive, meaning the interventionalist has seen an MR. He looked at it yesterday afternoon. He knows where he's going. And he walks in the room and does it under ultrasound. Then there's fused biopsy, where they take the MR that was done a day, a week, a month ago, and they fuse it to real-time ultrasound. And they have the transducer in the patient, and they map the ultrasound onto the MRI real time, and they go after the target based on the historic MR data with them fused together using um, elastic registration, um, different programs to get the margins to line up and form to each other. Um, so that's a very important distinction to make. Right. We in don't words, do that. Everything we, we do is an MRI. You use real time. You're in there and doing an MRI at the same in, time. We insert the needle in. We do the MRI. We position the needle. We take another MRI. We take the sample, and we're done. So it's really targeted. Really targeted. As opposed to having a map from yesterday and, and, and trying Correct. to match Correct. And the theoretically, map. theoretically, fusion is an excellent idea in terms of cost containment and have a neurologist be able to do you know, better biopsies than random, having that historical MR data to guide things is, is an excellent approach. OK. And let's start over here with questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, salvage therapy a application of this, because if you have a radical prostatectomy with positive margins and, say, nine or higher uh, policemen, uh, is how would you go about treating that? Would it be That's an MRI a multi-parametric? That's an excellent question. We've had no men who've had prostatectomy come to us for salvage treatment to date. What we would do first thing is take an MR image and understand what exactly is still residing in your pelvis and potentially be able to debulk it. So that would be the goal. OK, another question here? Yes, uh, prior to the development of this, one of the exams that I was recommended to take was the color Doppler exam on the left of Ventura with the bottom of okay. This is eight years ago, prior to some of the advances. How does that relate to your new developments for sophisticated? It doesn't. <laughs> it's a totally different creature. Yeah, so ultrasound has really evolved over the years. I showed you how transducers got much better. Well, the actual echoes that are used, the sonar that's used to create the ultrasound images is better. They're able to do mapping of, of velocity of flow. They're able to use contrast bubbles, little micro bubbles, to enhance areas of suspicion. So it's come a long way, but it's a different creature. Um, we use no ultrasound at all in our practice. Not today. OK, question here. Yes. Um, I, I had a question on uh, the choice of the laser versus uh, cryo. Uh, it seems like the laser heats up like a little heat ball as opposed to a little ice ball. <laughs> it seems very similar, except just the opposite direction of temperature. Yeah. Is, that, is that an accurate observation? Um, and secondly, why not cryo versus the laser versus heat? So did everybody hear the question? What we're asking about is a distinction between laser therapy and cryotherapy. And if cryo makes an ice ball, does it laser make a heat ball? N the answer is no, because when you um, insert the laser, the, the, the term that's used is coagulation necrosis. It's vaporizing stuff. 
It's not making a heat ball. It's destroying something, right? Cryotherapy is freezing something. It's still there, but it's frozen. And cryotherapy historically has been referred to as focal therapy, but among those who do focal therapy, we call it regional therapy because it's usually the suspicious area and half the gland, or the suspicious area, half the gland, and the other quarter of the gland. So they do what they call hockey stick ablation or hemiablation, which is half the gland. With laser, we don't do hemiablation. We don't do hockey stick ablation. We go to the lesion, we contour the lesion, and we destroy the lesion. Is the laser pulsed? No. 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 When it's on, it's on. When it's off, it's off. Okay, question back there. I had uh, FLA last June. <coughs> I just had an MRI over at Imaging, Dr. Schwartzberg. Everything's clean, but there seems to be a lot of debate about this uh, rebot targeting the biopsy of the area that was ablated. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which way to go on that. I had that done uh, by Dr. Walter in Texas. I don't know if you're familiar with him in Galveston. Yep. Yeah, so he did that. He said everything's great. I've had the guy over here read it, and then he's read it. Everything's fine, but I just want to know if I need to keep going with the six-month biology of that area that was ablated. Um, we could talk individually after the meeting, and I have a proposal for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Question here. Uh, for your laser treatment, do you uh, screen patients for differentiating between diffuse disease versus yes. focal? How do you do that? With the imaging and the biopsies. So if a patient has had um, MR imaging and we see one large focus and areas of inflammation or potentially sparse Gleason pattern 6, which can be detected, the rate of detection isn't as high as aggressive and clinically significant disease, um, the, the area that we would go after would be high volume or Gleason equal to 7 or less. So what percentage of men are screened out because their disease is too diffuse? To <laughs> if I have to look back at my patient log, I mean, I have so many men that call me like on a daily basis. Um, and keep in mind, I'm working with people who've been imaged elsewhere, people that have had trusts elsewhere, people that have had MR guided biopsies, another institution. Among our men, um, I would have to say probably 10 to 15 percent of them that we ourselves image and do biopsy on are excluded from the trial just by virtue of the MR seeing something other than what we thought based on everything that had been done you know so I have a personal question now uh, you mentioned that if it's in the seminal vesicles you don't do it no mine's in the seminal vesicles will you do it someday I don't think so. Oh, <laughs> not <okay>. today. <laughs> All right. I know it's not in the trial, but do you see it being applied, the focal therapy being applied? Potentially. In, uh, okay. I feel the, better I think now. the precision and control are very helpful, and then you know, the, if you're going to destroy the seminal vesicle, you might as well do it surgically. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Question there. Uh, would calcium deposits in the prostate exclude therapy? No, not at all. What it can do is confound energy deposition. Um, and it could mess up insertion of a device. Um, when we bump into a little calcium block, it gives resistance, as you can imagine. It's like a little pebble. But if we know it's there and we see it's there, we go around it. But um, it's possible. You saw the brachytherapy seed patient, right? We go around brachytherapy seeds all the time. Okay, over here, any questions? All right. Okay, John. You, know, um, you showed the one major thing. <laughs> Uh, to me was the recurrence of um, cancer after radiation. Um, that's the first we've ever seen here. Although we've had radiation oncologists here, they did not show us that. We need to know the, um, the dose, which is now is 8.1. We use the uh, uh, oh, a rapid arc with 45 fractions. So I'd like to know more about that. Uh, the other thing is uh, we treat the whole prostate with radiation, probably as a prophylactic uh, thing for the rest of the prostate that's not cancerous. 
So we don't treat anything outside the process. Repeat the question. There's a long question, but it was something along the lines of recurrence rates for external beam and the dose that's administered and what the rates are with external beam, and also prophylactic external beam treatment for the whole gland. It's, it's the whole gland and the whole pelvis. We don't do any external beam ourselves. We get patients who've had external beam. The case that I showed was brachytherapy. So um, that in and of itself is a different creature. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a PubMed number on external beam recurrence rates off the top of my head, but they do exist, and I, I don't know what the, what the dose correlation is with recurrence. So I apologize, I can't answer. They include the current 8.1 gray at uh, rapid arc, for rapid arc. <coughs> well, we don't have that new. Uh, recurrence statistic rates? Statistics, yeah. yeah. I don't either. I, un I unfortunately I apologize. We can do a PubMed search though. Question. Yeah. If you had MRI and ultrasound, and there's differences, are, are there things that you should be considering one better than the other? When you say Obviously. ultrasound and MRI, you mean ultrasound guided biopsy and MR guided biopsy? Well, I've had uh, color Doppler ultrasound. If they're discordant, what do we do? Right. Uh, I, if you were my brother, my dad, I would suggest that whatever the MRI showed that was abnormal, we place a needle in it, just to be certain. It doesn't hurt to place the needle in there. Okay, question? Are your uh, MRIs... Easy for me to say, right? Are your MRIs transrectal? In other words, are they going through the rectal No. Wall? They're not, they're not... We use surface coils. Oh, okay. 100% of the time. The endorectal coil is inserted if you have a rectum. There are men that don't have a rectum. It's surgically absent. There are men that refuse to have the endorectal coil inserted in them for whatever reason. We respect that. And knowing what I know about um, just the sheer fact that at some point I'm going to see a guy that doesn't have a rectum, I've always had a surface coil protocol for that reason. And it works extremely well. It works for the localization, the detection, the treatment part of things and the follow-up. So you don't have to worry about an incidence of infection just from the MRI? Exactly, but I mean, the MRI, you won't get infection from an endorectal coil being inserted in you. Um, it's, it's considered a clean procedure, not a sterile procedure. Um, and if you want, I'll email you um, four papers that talk about field strength and surface coils. And it's just kind of, the fact that, yeah, you can find things at one and a half T and without an endocoil. Oh. Okay, a question over here. Uh, I'm a successful uh, active surveillance, and uh, I've also been monitoring the color Doppler two years in a row now. And uh, this multi-parametric MRI that you're talking about, you're saying to use that as monitoring for active surveillance. Is that also covered by Medicare or any insurance? Yes. The question was, um, this gentleman's been monitored for his disease by color Doppler for two years, and he's asking if multi-parametric MRI is covered under insurance, and it is. And will it also, uh, did I hear you correctly, that multi-parametric Metric will, will show on a prostate that there are cancer cells because the color Doppler has found nothing. The prostate MRI does not show cancer. The biopsy shows cancer. The MRI shows areas of suspicion. I hope that doesn't sound legal. What I'm saying is when we do the MRI, infection, inflammation, and malignancy can all look funny. So the radiologist looks at your picture. He or she is gonna look at every sequence that was run and go, hmm, looks funny, looks funny, looks funny, hmm, something funny's going on. And they can say, eh, it looks like it could be cancer. No one can say if it's cancer until a specimen's been taken. Only biopsy can say if it's cancer. There are folks that think 
spectroscopy could do it or other imaging, only biopsy or prostatectomy put in the prostate under a microscope can tell if a man has prostate cancer. So what the MRI will do is pick up areas that look suspicious. Okay, I have one final point on that. I've had biopsies done too, and they were, uh, the sec second or third time I had that was bleeding. So, uh, so the doctor, my uh, urologist said, well, no more um, biopsies for you for the time being. And then I discovered Peridopulin, and so my PSAs have continued to go down uh, after color Doppler. I've been taking with a finasteride or whatever. Finasteride. Yeah. And so I'm thinking out loud here. The uh, multi-parametric, something I should do to continue monitoring. If you were my brother or my dad, I'd give you a Christmas card with an order for a multi-parametric prostate MRI in it. A month late. I hope you forgive me. <laughs> okay, thank you for the question. That's a good question. Yeah. And uh, uh, as Bernard did points out, what, what these uh, people are looking at are shades of gray. Exactly. It isn't a big red flag saying cancer. It's shades of gray, and it's a question of how, how much you want to keep exploring that arena. You sound like you're in pretty good shape. Okay, Dr. J. I met Dirk Bernadette about, about a week and a half ago, I would say, in Indian Wells. Yes, sir. And the reason we met is uh, I've been gleasing six for three years. Each year, I uh, had an MRI, and we've been doing active surveillance, and I've been working with Dr. Mark Scholes up in Marina Del Rey. And I thought, well, I'm in great, I'm in great shape, I'm gleasing six, and I'll just keep an eye on it. So um, my PSA, once before and recently, started climbing. Now my, my PSA 15 years ago was eight. But I did have a history of prostatitis and other things that could explain it. But um, three years ago when I was actually diagnosed with prostate cancer, and my PSA then was 15. Well once before a couple of years ago and then just recently it climbed into the 20s two years ago when that happened dr Scholl said just wait it'll go back down it's probably from the inflammation and i did it it did go back down but it went up into 22 lately and it was time for my annual mri which i had done here at ucsd and um the reading came back a couple weeks ago saying um, grade five over five cancer likely. So that was very scary, of course, and other things that it said on that um, MRI reading. And I'm thinking, and it did go down. A month later, it did not go down. So now I'm thinking that I probably have a lethal level of prostate cancer. And maybe back three years ago, they. They did biopsy, but they missed the main one because it's blind. And maybe there was a, a more virulent cancer, and they missed it. So now it's catching up to me. And this was very disturbing, obviously. So I um, talked to Gene, I talked to George, and one of them mentioned you folks because I wrote a book on prostate cancer. And, and there you go. <laughs> Still number one at Amazon. <laughs> nice. So I know, I knew about, you know, laser, although I didn't know that much about it. I didn't know about you folks. And I did call and met Bernadette. We had some very nice long conversations. And what she explained to me about their method made total sense. They're doing a they're using their laser and their new methodology to do an MRI to do the, uh, the bias. They know where they're going, they know what they're gonna take. They're gonna pull the areas that are most concerning and tell me what really is my police? You know, did we really miss anything? And I went over there a week ago Thursday and met 
front of that, and met many of their staff and some of the doctors, and we did this MRI-guided biopsy, which made total sense to me. Why aren't we doing this everywhere? That's crazy that we're doing blind biopsies. How do you know that you haven't missed the main area? So I spent the afternoon there and came back home and got the results a couple days ago. I think it was late Tuesday. And it's the same old low uh, level prostate cancer and a lot of inflammation, which can indeed raise the PSA and it can do it when it wants to. Dr. Cohen, you bring up such an excellent point. Um, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I don't want to lose this thought. I didn't mean to walk in here and be gloom and doom. Oh my gosh, you get your MRI and they're going to find a worse disease than you thought you had. Conversely, what often happens is just what Dr. Cohen's describing. We confirm a low diagnosis or we find inflammation. There's a reason your PSA is going up. We find the reason, you know, and it's not always cancer, like I said before. Malignancy is one reason, infection and inflammation are the other two. Yeah, it was one of the reasons I went is we would do the MRI, which I needed to be done again, and we would do it guided. And we see where the problem is and what it is. And it would be fast. And speaking to you and then reading that, there's, a, there's that five um, step section of uh, YouTube. Or, uh, oh, the Dr. YouTube Fellow. video. Mm -hmm. and I, I, didn't read, I didn't see that until I came back, but I thought it was very helpful. And Good. it explained the whole point of it all. <laughs> that you're doing it blind. You're, you're pulling your matter from the most... The ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Totally blind. I call it poke and hope, but don't anybody repeat that because <laughs> urologists don't like it when I say that. And it's nothing derogatory. It's that it this is the year 2015 <clears throat> to not be doing a picture before you put something sharp in somebody's body is lunacy and also to do follow-up investigation as where, where that high PSA is coming from. Yep, exactly. I was a lot of sleep over there. Yeah. And then when I came back and got the results, you know, everything's great. You've been sleeping well? Yeah, he has. Very well. <laughs> Very well. Uh, Dr. J. Cohen is the author of this best-selling one, and are you going to come out of version of 2015? Probably another year. Okay, but you'll have the new news in, in there. Yes, and a lot about this technique. Right. This is, this is modern history. Yeah. It's a developing uh, technology throughout for prostate cancer. Uh, any questions over here? Okay, you have already had one, but you go ahead. Uh, I was wondering about the, uh, what's the difference between the accuracy of this multi-parametric MRI imagery and something like the C11 uh, acetate? I don't think there's been a randomized trial with C11 acetate and MR and multiparametric MRI, but um, they're totally different modalities. And I could do a Google search and a PubMed search for you, but we have not done any head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, one is a radionuclide study, the other's not. So. Okay. Question here. All right. So, and just yes. another thing about CL11 acetate, you need a cyclotron to have that study done, so there's got to be a cyclotron at the institution. It's just a whole, I keep talking about whole different creatures, totally different modality and um, different energy source. And also more cancer specific. Okay, okay. Tom? Great show. Um, a friend of mine, uh, several people have said, hey, I've got to see my urologist. My PSA went from 3.9 to 4.1 biopsy, right? And I try to tell him, I said, there's more, you know, there's more to it. You, you, you probably don't have prostate cancer, but if you're going to stick a needle in, find out where they're sticking it and what they're doing with it. And if um, my, m most of the guys I talk to believe my, my doctor knows everything, I don't have the manager's case, my doctor is manager. And I have to teach them that you're managing it, you have to demand uh, an MRI guided biopsy. Because if not, it's going to be poke and hope. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. and if they want to go to see you and they're in an um, HMO, 
what did it cost for this process? If they're insured. Were they insured you properly? raise a really good question. So uh, the MRI and the biopsy are covered by insurance. We talked about the titanium needle. Most payers don't cover that. So it'll be 250, 500 for that part of things. But under the Affordable Care Act, Everyone now has these super high deductibles in January, so the cost to patient A might be different than the cost to patient B, whether or not they've met their deductible and what their other circumstances are. All I can tell you is it is covered. Medicare covers it, and work with your payer to, to sort that part out. I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but we go through pre-cert on your behalf. If your doctor sends us the order, we'll do pre-certification, get authorization, and get you scheduled. So even though you know, you're know you absolutely right when you talk about managing your own care, and George, you said this earlier, get a folder, get a binder, get some post-its. At the very least, get documents as they're given to you and file them in chronological order. Because when you come to see me and you say, I want treatment, where do we begin? We've got to start at the beginning, look at where you are now, fill in the gaps, and then move forward. So, um, do you need a prescription or a doctor's order? For the laser, no. Be anything that goes through insurance, you've absolutely got to have an order for. And um, a lot of my patients recognize this when they hit the door. If, if they tell me that they can't get an order or, or they want to self-refer and they want to self-pay, then they come and they take care of that, but then they try to get a retro auth. Now it seems many insurances won't even allow you to get a retro auth. If you had the procedure without an order, they won't pay for it at all. A lot of them are like that. And it's a shame because I think doctors and patients should manage the patient, not an outside business entity. So if under the circumstances you decide that you want it now, you need it today, you've got the order, please let's go backwards and get retrospective payment, that doesn't sound unreasonable to me, but that's how they operate. And I, I wish they didn't. Yes? Question back there. Um, you did a super job on getting these samples, and what I'd like to know is um, who or which lab do you use to look at the samples, and do you routinely get a second opinion on samples? Excellent question. So he mentioned that the targeting is really good, and the question is how often do we get second opinions, who does them, and um, it's a pretty straightforward answer. Bostwick Labs, um, David Bostwick is our primary pathologist. Second opinions will usually go directly to him or to Johns Hopkins. Now, our service is an imaging service. We do the intervention that takes the specimen. Once that specimen's acquired and put in the jar, it belongs to the lab. So this applies to any biopsy that you have anywhere with anyone ever, not just us. If you have a question or concern about your biopsy or the path report, call the lab. So this is just one thing you should know. If you have a biopsy with us and want a second opinion, call the lab and get that arranged because we can't necessarily facilitate authorization of movement of a block from place to place to place. You would be the person initiating that action and getting the second opinion. Do you send it to this East Coast or to uh, Arizona? East Coast. East Coast, okay. Well, let me just add a note, personal note on, on uh, biopsies and second opinions. Uh, you saw that diagram of Gleason, one through five, you know. That's what uh, a pathologist would call a cartoon. Uh, the good is not in green and the bad is not in red. And the size exactly. of the cells are, don't necessarily look that. We had a pathologist come in here and showed us the slides. They all look pink and white. And the difference between a three and a four, which is a critical difference, I couldn't tell the difference. And, it's a, and so when they add it up, a, a low seven or a high seven is so variable and so important that it's good to get a second opinion on most biopsies. And you find out that, the, that that's a critical benchmark. And, and so it's very difficult and requires a high degree of expertise that uh, looking at these pink slides with some white spots. That's how I see it. it doesn't, they can see a lot more into it if they get a second opinion. And a second opinion should be outside the HMO. Because you all the stuff is on a computer in the HMO, and, and they have a colleg collegial uh, environment. If you want a real second opinion, uh, you gotta go outside, and uh, Johns Hopkins is a premier organization to have that done. Question. 
I, lady. I have to tell you this as a mother. You were talking about your son not wanting to have a PSA done. Well, my, since my husband's brother uh, had prostate cancer, we were very careful with him, and he always had his prostate checked. Well, when he turned out to be cancerous, I immediately called my three sons up and mm -hmm. said, you will go, you will have it done, and I want to know the numbers, and I want you to do it every year. Good for you. And I keep checking with them every year to make sure they've had it done. Yeah, how can you track it if you don't even get a baseline, right? right? And I, that's what they said, well, Ma, we're too young for that. I said, no. No, and, and we, we attended a focal therapy meeting recently where they were talking about an autopsy specimen on a four-year-old boy who had microscopic prostate cancer features. So, I mean, you know, we all have, and let's face it, we're human beings, we're environmentally exposed to things, we have genetic makeup that makes us more or less susceptible to bad things. And uh, they rear their ugly head at a certain age, under certain conditions, either ag aggressively or not so aggressively, and each of us possesses our own immunosuppressive ability to fight it. So it's very, very individual, this disease. Okay, and call your mother, right? <laughs> call her. Okay. You... Time for one more, one more question, yes. Has he had an MRI? Said they didn't find anything, but they know there's something going on, so they started treating him with the Lupron and Casabex. Without an MRI? At that time, yes. Okay. So, how, My how can you do, can, can he get this MRI done? Can we see if there's still something present and, and get it treated? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, um, so the question was, after having received radiation therapy, there was evidence of biochemical recurrence, meaning the PSA went too above that nadir that we talked about, and then so the solution was to put him on hormone therapy without any imaging. So, um, and I'm not a doctor, I'm a research director, and in the context of my clinical trial, he could meet the salvage arm inclusion criteria if he meets other health type uh, requirements and we get some imaging and an MR guided biopsy. So the step one would be imaging. All right, we want to thank Bernadette for a wonderful informative presentation. Thank you, thank you, I really appreciate it.